Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, I have to cut in. Look at verse uh, 7. We're up. And Amanda, we're going to talk about the eternal purpose of God. Um, try to show you some things before and from the foundation of the world and some things opened up there. Uh, Ephesians 3, verse 7, whereof I am made a minister, okay? You'd have to read the first six verses and get the gist of it, that the prisonership of Paul, the dispensation of the grace of God given to the Gentiles, and verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto men. So just because it wasn't made known didn't mean it. there wasn't some truth there that was hid. But what I want to show you tonight, if I, I can get it all straight, there is things that are hid from the foundation of the world in Scripture and in God, and all of them represent a time before the foundation of the world. And what it is is the collective body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the uh, body of Christ is a body of believers from the beginning of Paul, Paul being the first in it, and it will go to where the last member is found by the gospel and we leave this earth, okay? Uh, this earth is, is called an evil world and our bodies are called vile and unrighteous and so forth and so on. But God had an eternal purpose in it. Now watch this in verse uh, 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So whatever is revealed to the church, the body of Christ, is being made known to the principalities and powers. And of course, that's why the Ephesian and Colossian letter are totally ignored in religion. And people will take Paul's letters, yes, and they'll talk about grace and even use Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but they will not show or do they see the truth in the mystery but now verse 11 according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in christ jesus our lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him and of course the faith of him there will be changed in the new translations to the faith our faith in him and that's not what it says your faith in him does not give you access it is part of the access, but it won't give you access unless his faith did what was necessary first. And that that's so true in the Galatian letter, Galatians 2.16. And we'll get to that in just a minute, but there's something. Paul's early letters are, are basic letters of, of setting the, and, and you understand the Jews were dealt with first by Paul the elect, according to Romans 11, verse 5, uh, uh, according to this present time, also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Grace is no more work. So when Paul steps out in his ministry, he's sent out, he's got to deal with the Jews first, and he's dealing with them in Acts 13, 38, 39. Like I said, we'll go there in just a minute too, but as he deals with them, he's got to show them that their law that they have been keeping first is probably traditional, but that the law of Moses has been done away with in Christ. And so you see the fact of his, his battle and his thing about going out, the people that he deals with first are Jews and they're Jewish elect according to grace. And obviously, Romans 3, 1, what advantage hath the Jew much every way? So you'll find that Romans, the Corinthian letter, the uh, Thessalonian letter, and the Galatian letter have a lot to do with the fact of the law being taken out of the way. And that would be really knowledgeable to the Jews that he's dealing with. But also, the Jews have been <clears throat> putting the law on Gentiles, and the Roman letter is written to 
Gentiles that were circumcised. So you have to you have to look at Paul's message and understand that when he the first letters he wrote from the foundation world is going to be based on the gospel of Christ, which is the righteous of God without the law. And like I said, we'll go through all this, but uh, look with me in Ephesians chapter one, verse nine. He said, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Somebody said one time, they'd like to know the will of God. What was what? According to the good pleasure which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This mystery involved the fact that there were, there were people that had went to sleep in the Lord in the first century. And the dispensation here he refers to of the fullness of times is bringing forth a mystery that's been hid in God. Now, I want you to understand this. Uh, go back and get the terminology, Ephesians 3, 9, to make all see, men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, okay? The first mystery that Paul revealed was the gospel of Christ. And he never received it of man, neither was it taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's Galatians chapter 1. Go with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and watch verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According, he has chosen us in him. And this again is the collective whole body knowledge. The, the whole how many ever are in the body of Christ. And you can't get in the body of Christ until you hear the gospel of Christ you trust it and you get sealed. You're baptized by one spirit into one body. That's 1 Corinthians 12. And But when you talk about the whole body, then all the letters of Paul are based on the body. But the first letters that he wrote, he's going to the Jew first and then also the Greek and the barbarian and, and the Gentiles. And they are, it is to keep them from being legalized by the law of the Jews around them, trying to legalize them again. Uh, and even Peter in Acts 10, who went to Cornelius, a uh, uncircumcised Gentile, which Peter says an unlawful thing for him to be there, but God had showed him the sheet let down and so forth. So <clears throat> he said, I perceive that whosoever feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That's not the Ephesian letter. The Ephesian letter says we're accepted in the beloved. Matter of fact, look at Ephesians 1.6. For the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, not in works of righteousness, which is very clear. Look in Titus chapter 3. In Titus 3. Look what Paul says in verse 5. Titus 3, no, 4. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, okay? Not, not of works of righteousness. It's by him and the beloved were accepted. Peter said, you that fear God and work righteousness. Uh, I apologize, you didn't say it that way. I'm not going to misquote it to you. I'm going to read from uh, Acts 10, verse 34. Uh, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness accepted with him. That is not Paul's message. You didn't work righteousness. As a matter of fact, Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. And when God took the righteousness ability, which would be keeping the law, Deuteronomy 6.25, when he took the, the ability of people, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, when he took the law away, and when I say away, Jesus fulfilled the law. And then Romans 3, look at Romans 3, becomes very evident and very clear. And of course, this is why they didn't like Paul, is because he's preaching that you can't work righteousness. Well, if you can't work righteousness, what can they do? Well, Romans 3, 10, uh, 321. 
But now the righteous God without the law is manifest. The manifestation of Romans 16. Hold here, go to Romans 16. Things that are manifest. Okay, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Paul's gospel has nothing about you doing anything. Paul's gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. Hold on. Now that's the gospel that saves. Look in Philippians. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, look what Paul says here in verse 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness. Paul thought he was righteous before the Lord appeared to him. He is touching the righteous law blameless. That's in verse uh, 6. Now he has to give up all thoughts that he was righteous. And he declares, Romans 3.10, there's none righteous. And you see, righteousness is about the law. It's, that's clear. Romans, go back to Romans 3. Verse 21, but now the righteous God without the law, okay? Without the law, there's no possibility of righteousness to the Jews that he's speaking to in his letters. And that's why you find it in Romans and the Corinthian letter, the Galatian letter. <clears throat> he's trying to show the Jews that are among the congregation he's preaching to that they can't trust the righteousness of the law that they've kept all their life. How do I know? Look at Romans 10. See, it's like taking church away from somebody or water baptism away from them. They put all their stock, all their pennies and nickels into church and in water baptism and all that. And when you show them that God changed the whole program in grace, and grace has nothing to do with you getting baptized. It has nothing to do with you going to church. It has nothing to do with you keeping the commandments or that you're good out while you're bad. Your good or outweigh, outweighing your bad has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation was performed by the faith of Jesus Christ when he died for our sins, according to Scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Now read Romans 10. Again, Paul is trying to clarify how that the law is not the issue, and righteous self-righteousness is not the issue. Now watch. Romans 10, 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. The zeal, going to church, or being very, very dedicated to your church, has nothing to do with knowledge. Matter of fact, most zealous people in religion are not very knowledgeable about the Bible or anything that God did. They have no idea about the eternal purpose of God. They, they don't see the mysteries involved in Paul's messages. But now verse 3, 2, For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And that's that's Israel, that's his brethren. Verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. There it is. Ignorant to God's righteousness. You see, that's what's wrong with people. They're ignorant to the righteousness of God. Uh, read this, and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back to Romans 3 in a minute. For they being ignorant of God's right, going back to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteous God. Submission is exactly what Paul talked about in Philippians. Everything he did in life as a Jew, everything he did as a Jewish believer, circumcised, he had, his mom and dad did that, circumcised the eighth day, a Pharisee, a Hebrew, a Hebrew touching the righteous law blameless. He was a lawyer, a Pharisee, all that, he said, I count it, but dung, dung, which is a sin offering from an animal. The dung is cut out of an animal and taken outside the camp and burnt for a sin offering. And Paul said, everything I did is, is just sin. It's just, it has nothing to do. It's, it's the works of the flesh. And no one in Romans 8, 8 can please God in the flesh. You have to submit to ha have God operate on you. Look. Look at this verse and, and hold on to uh, uh, Romans 10. Well, I'll read it and then I'll go to Philippians uh, if that's the one I want. Uh, 
Philippians and um, well, anyway, Romans 10, 10, uh, 4, Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteous everyone that believes. Somebody said, how do you judge people on what they believe? I listen. I don't judge them how they look, dress. That doesn't matter to me. I listen. And as I listen, number one, if a person is confessing their sins, they're still under the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law, according to 1 John. All is sin and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> to confess your sins is telling God that you're still dead in your trespasses and sins according to Ephesians 3, uh, Ephesians 2, you're not. To confess your sins, you're, you have not submitted to the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. Get Colossians uh, chapter 1, uh, 2, Colossians 2 and Romans chapter 10 again, and verse uh, 3, Romans 10, 3. For well, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Ignorance is not bliss, folks. And ignorance is what Paul was trying to bring them out of. I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you be ignorant. And when I talk to people, I don't want them ignorant. Now, you can read the Bible all you want. You can read it cover to cover. You can study it and just still be ignorant to the truth that's hid in the scriptures and something that's hid in God. Okay, now watch. He said, they being ignorant of God's right, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And a submission there means that they get away from their sacrificial table, which that caused them to crucify the Lord. They stumbled at the table that they had, and instead of accepting that Jesus was Messiah, they didn't want him because they were trusting in their law and their things they did, just like people trust in being church members and going to church and giving their tithes and offerings and everything else. They trust in those things. But that's not making your relationship with God. It has nothing to do with the relationship with God. The relationship with God is by the faith of Jesus Christ, which the King James is the Bible that preserves the faith of Christ. But now verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law. So I know then in verse Romans 10, 4, the law is what he's talking about when he talks about their own righteousness, which that is what Paul said in Philippians, as touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. Yet he wasn't. He never kept the Mosaic law. He kept the traditional law of Israel. And in doing so, keeping that traditional law is not his, it's not good enough in the dispensation of grace because it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. <clears throat> we could bless a Jew. That won't help us. We could try to keep the law. That wouldn't help us. Besides, what sacrifice would we offer? The sacrifice has already been made in Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. What do we got? So if we go back to where he's dealing with the Jews first and talking to the Jews, which were supposedly law keepers, they have to submit to somebody else's work. That's it's like people do a job and and they do something on the job that really helps the company out and somebody else takes the credit. Jesus Christ satisfied God. His faith satisfied the Lord from the time he's born until the time he's risen. He is living for God. When he goes into hell, he's doing that for us to satisfy God. When he dies, he allows God to make him to be sin. When he dies because he has been made sin, he dies for our sins. He goes down into hell, takes our sins down there, gets rid of them. And the third day he arises. And in that resurrection, we're forgiven because it's redemption. It's adoption. But you see the early believers they were justified by this man, Jesus, which Paul preaches in Acts 13, 38. He said, by this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I mean, that totally threw them for a whammy because they always believed that there was something they were lacking, and that's why they were always offering up sacrifices and confession of sins 
and other things that people do and uh, getting baptized. People says, I, I got baptized. Just make sure. Make sure of what? What are you making sure of? I go to church to make sure I have a relationship with God. No, you, you're not having a relationship with God. The most high dwelleth not temples made with hands. Stephen preached in Acts 7. Paul preached in Acts 17. You can't go into a building and expect God to be there. Well, how could that be possible if you had three different churches within a mile of each other and none of them agreed? Why would God go into any of them? He said, how could two walk together except they be agreed? If God don't agree what they're doing in that and calling at the house of God, why should I go in there? Why should I spend my time and effort trying to please God when already God is pleased in his son? I'm going to submit to that. But the submission there in Romans 10 is the Jew believers submitting their own righteousness and declaring it but dumb and submitting to the righteous of God, which is, now watch, in, in Romans chapter 3 and Colossians. All right. Now, Romans 3 is based on the law. Now, watch. In Romans 3, verse uh, 3, what if some did not believe? Some Jews, some people. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? The faith of God. What is the faith of God? No, man's faith has failed. Man's faith has failed because of Adam. Wherefore, by one man, sin in the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. If you don't think you're a sinner, you don't see the book anyway. So you as a sinner have failed God, but Jesus didn't. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet knew no sin. He did not fail God. He did not fail the law. He did not fail in living. He lived righteousness. And so when he died, the righteousness of God is his faith. Now watch, go to Colossians. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. And you're complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers, in whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Our submission today in knowledge is that we're crucified with Christ. Same message the Galatians had in Galatians 2.16, uh, 2.20. We have been crucified. Same message of Romans 6, where the old man has been dead, been crucified. We've been crucified, and we have been circumcised. Now, this circumcised, I want you to go back to verse 10. In whom you're completing it, in the head of the prince about, in whom also we are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now, this is good for you ladies. In the Old Testament, the women submitted to the man, and the man, if he's righteous, and when I say righteous, under the law, trying to keep the law, he's the one circumcised. And the household follows him and the sacrifices are made for the household in this day and age every individual has the right to believe and the belief there is based on something that's spiritually done not uh, fleshly done circumcision is a cutting away from the body circumcision in the old testament was something that was cut away from the body and the foreskin was considered the token. And the men did it. The women didn't do that. And so, in this day and age, in this dispensation of grace, the ladies are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the fact that they agree with God that the body of the sin of the flesh are cut away. Well, how did they get cut away? Well, Jesus Christ was circumcised the eighth day, but he was also circumcised when he died on the cross. He left his body. And the body was made sin. And it, it, it's, it's incredible how God did this. It was made sin so that he would die for our sins. And dying for our sins 
when he left that body and went down into hell, he's cut away from the representation of us. The representation of us is that his body was made sin, but he took the sins down, away, away from it, forgiven if he raises, and he did. Now, if Jesus don't raise, you're still in your sins. That's 1 Corinthians 15. If he doesn't come out, if he doesn't raise, you're yet in your sins, and how miserable are we preaching? But he did raise. And of course, I never have understood good Friday. What, what's so good about Friday? I mean, if if that all associated with Friday and resurrection, where'd all the three days and nights go? Well, Jesus Christ was crucified Wednesday night, according to Jewish time. Okay. Uh, they had to put him in the grave uh, or in the tomb at, before 6 p.m. because 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. is a Jewish day. And after 6 p.m. is a, another holy day, the, the fifth, uh, first month, 15th day, and it's called the week of unleavened bread. But uh, the idea that he, something Friday and got up uh, when he got crucified, he was crucified on Wednesday, put in the tomb right before 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Wednesday 6 to Thursday 6 is one day. Thursday 6 to Friday 6 is one day. That's two days. Friday uh, 6 to Saturday 6 p.m. is three days. And they came early in the morning. He's gone. Why? He rose that day, that night. I mean, that night. So that's how you make it. You can't make Friday involved in anything. The Catholics did, though. But it isn't. It isn't involved in the in the scriptures at all. And so Good Friday, I don't know what Good Friday is. Uh, a Good Friday is that you don't have to work Saturday, I guess. But uh, everything that's preached and talked about is usually a, a lie, and it is. Uh, it, it's just uh, overwhelms me that people won't study. But anyway, go back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised. Yes, lady. You are. If you trust Christ, you've been cut away from your body. Yes, man, you're circumcised. You've been cut away from your body if you trust him with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I let him take my sins. I let him die my death. He died for my sins. The, the vision of God was that how do I get rid of man's sins? How do I not judge them for sins? Well, Jesus died for our sins. And, and the Bible says in Romans 2, 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by my gospel. Okay, so Jesus takes the sin of the world. That's death. He takes the sins so that men in Revelation will be judged according to their work. Well, we are being brought before the judgment seat of Christ because of the works of Christ, and our works in him will be judged for reward. What a blessing. What a blessing to have that instead of the great white throne where you're judged for your works to see whether you're in the book of life, and if you ain't, then you're cast into the lake of fire. You can never be cast into the lake of fire if you submit to the Lord. You can't go to the great white throne judgment if you trust in the Lord. You can't go in the ground if you trust in the Lord. All you can do is live your life. He sealed you, secured you, guaranteed you that you wouldn't go in the ground. He told you in 2 Corinthians 5, you'd be uh, took up to your new house, made without hands, again, made without hands. You have the circumcision made without hands. You have the <clears throat> the the death, the burial, and the resurrection in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a tremendous verse. That's, that's Galatians 2.20. But the early Jews and the Gentiles that Paul preached to, the Greeks and barbarians, they're being shown their self-righteousness. The Colossians didn't have much self-righteousness. And it's quite obvious if you read Colossians chapter one, look in verse 21. 
And you that were sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works. They're, they're not. They, they, from what they saw and heard and everything, they didn't figure they had any relationship with God at all. And Paul sent them a letter. And the letter was sent to them, and it also was to be read in Laodicea for some people that didn't know God, didn't know. I mean, in Acts 17, Paul went to Athens and preached to those people that didn't know who God was. And he told them he's the creator of heaven and earth. He made everything, and it's all his. And he showed them the gospel, no doubt, of who Jesus Christ was and what he did. But now think, maybe in your life, you came to a point and you realized there's no way that God probably will save me. I've heard people say, well, I've done too many things for God to save me. Well, what was that you did? What did you do so bad that God couldn't save you? If the law is gone, and, and what is it you're confessing? Are you confessing daily sins? What, what are those daily sins? Well, there, you're, you're not breaking the Ten Commandments, most likely. I mean, you might be breaking the number one one, obviously, but you're not breaking the commandments by smoking, drinking, dancing, playing cards, all that stuff that people preach on all the time, uh, drinking especially. You're not breaking the commandments. Why are you confessing it to, to God? Because you were told that you were unrighteous if you did those things. Where is that in the Bible? That You were unrighteous in the first place. You can quit everything you do and you're still unrighteous. It's only when. Only when you've been made righteous. Look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And hold on to Colossians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Righteous is not imputed to us. We are made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, has made him the Lord to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that, of course, is the... Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And by the way, you're not born again. You're created. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Our apostle doesn't talk about being born again. He talks about we're a new creature in Christ. He said, we, uh, verse 17, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We're walking newness in Christ. And God said so. We are the walking newness that God created. You see, when Adam was made from the dust and God breathed into him breath of life, he was created right. What happened was that the temptation was presented and he succumbed and he sinned. He Oh, disobeyed the Lord. And when I say sin, he disobeyed the Lord. And in that disobedience, all his children from then to now are children. But God wants to take you out of disobedience. Well, how can he do that? Well, he can take and substitute a sacrifice that's not an animal sacrifice with blood. He can take a human being, which Jesus Christ was called the Son of Man, flesh and blood. And he can take that man and it will satisfy the righteousness that God demands. You see, in Deuteronomy 6, he said, if you do all the commandments, all orders shall be your righteousness. And Paul said, there's none righteous. God wants you to be right. Just like the last Adam. He wants you in the image of the last Adam, but you can't be that unless you trust him. It can be there all your life and you never trust him. The righteous of God is available to you all your life. The operation of God, go back to Colossians, I'll show you something. Colossians 2, verse 11. In whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. God got rid of your problem, which was death because of your body. And in verse 12, buried with him in baptism. That's the baptism of death. Luke 12, 50 said, I have a baptism to be 
baptized with us three, three and a half years after he's baptized of John. This is the second baptism. This is the most important baptism because when he gets baptized into death, if we trust that, then by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. First Corinthians 12, 13. We're not born again because water is not the issue in Paul's message. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 17. Water is not the, the message, it's not the power, it's not the instrument of Paul's preaching. The preaching of the power is the gospel of Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And you understand when he says that, the Jews are trying to make him ashamed. They're trying to put him down. And of course, uh, he was put in jail in Acts uh, 16. But right before that, he was stoned to death. And, and from 16 on, they begin to ch ch chase him, put vows on their head. He becomes a prisoner and uh, in uh house arrest later on and finally in Acts 28 he turns to the Gentiles because the Jews are so belligerent at this time that they won't believe and so he said lo I turn to the Gentile and that's where you get the Ephesian and Colossian letter which they are about the eternal purpose of God which based on the fact that they get to hear the gospel and that was what was hid in God. What was hid in God is we got to hear the gospel and we got made part of the fellowship. You see, Ephesians 2 is very clear on this. Uh, and we'll read just saying, but I want to read verse 12 of Colossians 2 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. The operation of God was sometimes when you get operated on, they cut things away. Sometimes they cut things away that you don't want to cut away. Well, again, circumcision is without hands. He cut us away from what we are. That's the operation of God. And being cut away, we are complete in him. I mean, we don't have to, men don't have to be circumcised. And obviously, women can't worry about it. You don't have to be baptized because you're baptized. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Verse uh, 4, there's one body, body of collective believers that have trusted the gospel of Christ, been sealed with the Holy Spirit by one spirit. He said, <clears throat> there's one body, one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's for sure, okay? So let's let that be. Let's let God be true. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay? Baptism, it said in Colossians, go back to Colossians, chapter 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism. In whose baptism? In the baptism of the Lord. Uh, Look in Luke 12, the one I was quoting, and look what it says here. And remember, Jesus Christ is about getting close to 33 years old. And in Luke 12, verse 50. And if you don't think baptism doesn't mean something to people, take it away from them and see what happens. They put a lot of stock in water baptism. And water baptism has nothing to do with grace. Water baptism has something to do with Peter and the 12 apostles in the kingdom and the gospel of circumcision, water baptism is their basis of their message. Why? Luke 2, uh, Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent and be baptized. That's not the baptism of Jesus Christ. That's baptized in water because in uh, uh, 1 Peter, he said, water which also doth now also save us. Water saves in Peter's message. It doesn't save in Paul. The baptism of Jesus Christ going into death saved us. Look at Luke 12, 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Jesus was going to be baptized into death, and in his death, you're in it. Go back to Colossians and watch. Verse 10, and you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. If you're complete, Trust that. Let God be true. 
Quit worrying about what you will or won't do or what you can or can't do. Quit worrying about trying to please God in your activity of your flesh because you can't please God in the flesh. And trust God to have cut you away from what you are by the circumcision of death. And trust that he baptized you into one body by the baptism of Christ into death. And trust the fact that you have been raised, seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ, and that he sees you holy and without blame before him in love. God wants to see you the way he created you. You see, you go back. He didn't want to see Adam with big leaves on him, hiding his indiscretions or his discretions. He wanted to see Adam the way he created him. He created him right. And Adam covered up because now he sees his nakedness. He didn't see it before. God wants to see you and how he created you in Christ. And all you have to do is trust him and he'll see you for it. He'll see you. Look in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, in whom you also trust. Now, trust is, is something where you let go. You just submit to it and let go. You just submitting is comes believing, you submit, you trust. All right. In verse 13, the Jews had to submit to the righteous God without their own work. We have to submit to God without works of righteousness. We have to submit to God without church going or uh, uh, tithes and our sacrifice of time and our water baptism. Just, just forget all that stuff and trust God because he wants to see you how he made you. He don't want you to hide what he did with your self-righteousness. He don't want to see you with all your self-proclaimed works. He wants to see you the way he created you. And he created you in Christ. Now watch. Verse 13, in whom you also you trust that you heard the word of truth. Heard is how, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 said, please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Uh, Romans 10, 13, who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him whom they not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings a good thing. The gospel of peace is not gospel of condemnation. It becomes the gospel of condemnation if you resist it or turn it down or receive it not. Then it becomes condemnation. But it's a gospel of peace. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We're therefore being justified by faith. We're at peace with God, Romans 5.1. All right, verse 12, 13 again. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salva, of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. I never knew anything about being sealed when I was young. When I walked the aisle for Jesus and joined the Baptist church, they never told me I sealed, but they did tell me you have to live it. Live it? I never lived it. And you know what? I ain't never met anybody that lived it. I have never met anybody that lived it. The only one I ever heard about living it is Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet knew no sin. And he is the uh, image of it, the, uh, according to Hebrews, I'll let me read that to you. The word escaped me. Express. He's the express image of God. He looks exactly like God wanted. And did you know that God made you to look that same way? That we might be conformed to the image of his dear son. And Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So God's looking at his son in you. Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you realize in Romans 12, when he said, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God with your reasonable service. That is what God created. He said, you're bought with a price, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, 
Know you not that your body is the temple and Christ dwells in you because you let him come in. Why did you let him come in? You trusted the fact that God made that body whole and without blame. You see, if you weren't made holy without blame, why would Christ come in? He's not going to enter a sin body. He's going to enter into somebody that's been made holy and without blame. Oh, yeah, we have that sin body. Don't get me wrong. But he enters into your mind. That's how you serve God, Romans 7. Uh, oh, oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of his death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve myself serve the law of God. With the flesh, the law of sin. That's why you have such a hard time once you believe and actually start seeing truth. The hard part about it is that you know you, what your flesh still is. And it wrestles with you. And it, it's contrary. It, uh, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and the contrary to the one to the other. And you cannot do what you would. You you wrestle. And so you depend on the faith of God and the grace of God, the measure he gives to you to do your ministry. But presenting your body is where you let him use you any way he wants. Now, you understand God uses people whether they like it or not. Even lost people are used by God to help save people. That, that That's happened to me many times. Save people that didn't even like me. Help me. They, they gave me money or they helped me do something. They didn't even care for me. And that's the grace of God. God is able to make all grace around the orgy. And the, the issue is, if I preach to you that you need to clean up your life and you can't do it, that's why it's so hard in a rescue mission. They try to get the individuals, the men in there and, and ladies, whatever, that are drunks, to try to get them to quit drinking so they can serve God. Th that's not how you serve God. Whether you, you drink or not, that's not how you serve God. You serve God in your mind. And the testimony that you give is the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you. What did Jesus Christ do for me? He died for my sins, according to Scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to Scripture. And in that burial, he had been cut away. He'd been, first, he'd been circumcised away from his body, and his soul went down into hell. And it's all done so that I never ever will go into hell or into the grave. All I can do is go to sleep in the Lord. The body of sin can be destroyed. It won't matter. Or I can have this vile body changed fashion like into his glorious body, of Philippians 3.21, and be caught up to go see the Lord in the air and be with him forevermore. All those are passages are in the Bible that people don't preach and teach. And people are never ever secure or happy when they're trying to do it themselves. Quit trying to do it yourself and let God see the image he created by trusting what Christ did and then Christ comes into your body and into your body dwells there and the spirit of Christ dwelling there feeds you in knowledge and the more you read, the more he shows to you. And the more you get shown to you, the stronger you are to withstand the wiles of the devil and the darts of the devil. Oh, he comes after believers. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 4, 5 is really clear about that. But the idea of why is he after you? Some, somebody said, well, why can't I have a life of peace? Because the devil... It's not only given have to believe on Christ for, on the behalf of Christ, it's also given to suffer for his sake. And the suffering for his sake comes because we are witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, for our scripture, it was buried. But if he don't raise, there's no justification, there's no glorification, there's no redemption, there's no forgiveness, and on and on. We are witnesses. We are the living body of Christ. We have Christ in us, and the fruit of the Spirit is in love and kindness and, and all the things listed in Galatians chapter 5. Yet all the time, this flesh is mean and ornery, 
And if you don't think so, why would he have to change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body when the time gets to be caught up? You didn't clean it up. <clears throat> God made a new creature. I look in Ephesians 2, and I shut up in Ephesians 2. Look at verse 10. For well, we are his workmanship. And I guarantee you the operation of God and the faith of God and what God did is perfect. It's perfect. That's why in Philippians 3, as many of us as be perfect. We have eternal life. And you can't have eternal life unless you've been made perfect. You can't have eternal life unless you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We walk in his work. So walk in a image that he made. The image of the last Adam. Walk in that holy and without blame thing that God made. And give God the credit. Give God the glory. Be his witness, his testimony of what God hath done. And Paul <clears throat> talked about the testimony of God. And he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you? Or do you even know it? Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Or do you know it? You see, the thing about people is they're trying to submit their own righteousness. What they've done for God. You ain't never done anything for God. God did it all. And he knew he'd have to do it all because salvation belongs unto the Lord. And so he made a new creature in the dispensation of grace. And that new, new creature is in the image of the last Adam. It's holy and without blame. And so present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God with your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get in the word, get in Paul's letters and renew your mind and understand that the things that you think are not the way God does. He said, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are above you. He said, my word will never return void. So let his word dwell in you and it's not going to return void. Amen. 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 Amen.